Uh, so our last, but uh, definitely not the least speaker is Katie Pollard uh, from UC San Francisco. So Katie has done a lot of great work in comparative genomics, and her lab has contributed a lot of uh, useful uh, tools uh, for the uh, comparative genomics and the uh, integrative analysis for uh, multiple large-scale data analysis. Uh, actually, I'm a big fan of Katie's work, not only because the science is exciting, her lab, the software from her lab is always quickly released and deposited to GitHub and uh, many bioconductor packages. I think that's also the spirit of ENCODE, is to share the work with the, the whole community. And that's what the good science should about, right? So today, Katie will talk about uh, the topic of, the title of our talk is uh, Many Transmit Factors Recognize DNA Shape. So Katie. Thanks a lot. Um, it's great to be here today to talk about some very new work in my lab at the interface between structural biology and bioinformatics. Um, and before uh, digging into that main topic for the talk, though, I wanted to give a brief overview of some of the other regulatory genomics projects in my lab that motivated us to move towards um, this new project. Um, so the, the motivation for um, a collection of projects we've been working on that use machine learning and statistics to try to model gene regulation at the level of individual regulatory elements and of chromatin interactions is to um, understand uh, how non-coding variants would uh, potentially have phenotypes, as several of the speakers have mentioned. So um, the, the main hypothesis we started with was that non-coding variants would alter transcription factor sequence motifs in regulatory elements and then alter expression of their target genes. And so to understand that, you have to first know where the regulatory elements are. Those are the green boxes. You have to know whether a mutation would alter the function of that enhancer. I'm denoting that with the sequence logo there. And then a big problem is mapping those to the right gene because we know the closest gene is only right about 10 percent of the time. Um, so we've been approaching this computationally, utilizing data from ENCODE and other public repositories um, that we're very grateful to have available to us um, to try to shed with computational models some light on the um, experimental techniques like hi C and some of the other assays that you've been hearing about um, today and throughout the meeting. So, um, the first project was to, to get a better handle on where the truly functional enhancers are in the human genome. And um, th we were motivated to do this because uh, many regions of the genome carry one or two or even a handful of the marks of active enhancers. They get called an active or a weak enhancer in a genome segmentation. Um, but we saw that when we looked at them and tested them either in vivo or with massively parallel reporter assays that uh, many of them uh, either don't drive uh, gene expression very well or don't consistently, when we look at high c data, loop consistently to a particular gene. So that suggests they're not really biologically active. So are some of these sort of potential enhancers, um, you know, better than others? To do that, to attack this, we used a biological definition of enhancer that it can drive a reporter gene in a developing embryo. We focused on developmental enhancers because the assay works well there, but we're also doing them in stem cell derived, um, various stem cell derived in vitro systems. Um, we built models um, that would predict or distinguish the, uh, the sequences that can drive enhancer activity from the ones that don't. And um, we were able to do much better than what you get if you just overlap or intersect individual ChIP-seq data sets. This is a performance curve with a low false positive rate. We had a much higher true positive rate than the typical thing of just intersecting or overlapping data sets. So the machine learning and the integration of massive amounts of data, these were thousands of data sets, some of which seemed irrelevant to the task at hand because they were from a cancer data set or something. Uh, we really could do better at predicting what bio, which, in, which candidate enhancers are biologically active. And then when we go and test those either in vivo um, or in stem cell based systems, here these are beating cardiomyocytes that we derive with colleagues from pluripotent stem cells, um, we see that um, these predictions uh, validated a very high rate, higher than if you just took a random subset of the things that might be an enhancer. Um, so we think this biological definition is very important. The next question is whether a mutation in an enhancer has an effect or not on its function. 
And um, a number of people have been thinking about this. Um, our contribution was fairly mathematical, which was to try to figure out what happens to um, the ability of transcription factors to bind when you induce a mutation in an enhancer. And knowing that there can be turnover, especially over evolutionary time periods, but even in the human genome, there can be multiple compensatory mutations. We looked at the total effect on the enhancer activity, the cumulative regulatory potential. This turned out to be sort of an unsolved math problem because there were, um, these are both uh, Bernoulli trials for the hits uh, for binding, and they're correlated because the sequences are related to each other. So we worked out a distribution to get a p-value for the net change in binding potential when you have multiple mutations in a region of the genome. Um, and these, uh, this data predicted very nicely changes of, of function where you can see a restriction in the domain of expression for this enhancer um, in the mutant compared to the wild type. Um, so um, the really hard problem, or at least I thought it was going to be really hard, would be to map these enhancers and their variants to genes. And I knew this would be hard because um, of mounting evidence that the closest gene, which is what many of us have been using for a long time, is not usually the target gene, that the structure of this toy locus could look something like this, where um, this genetic association pointed to this region, this enhancer prediction pointed to maybe this variant, but we certainly wouldn't want to follow up gene C and the pathways that it's in because it's actually looping over here to gene A, as we've been hearing about in other talks. Um, so there is uh, increasingly experimental data to look at this, um, and, and uh, Bing told us about a massive amount that should be out soon with promoter capture, for example. Um, but uh, we thought it would be interesting to see if there's information in other data, in particular in the one genomic, genomic, one-dimensional genomic signatures along the genome um, that would basically allow us to do an in silico high C and to accurately predict high C interactions. So if we look at express genes in a locus, and here we're inside of a TAD. So not look, trying to recapitulate the TAD structure, but individual promoter enhancer interactions within, say, a one or two megabase part of the genome. And we have lots of enha active enhancers, and we have a number of active promoters. Can we pair them up with each other accurately or not? Um, and this is important um, uh, for two reasons. One is that um, unless you do a lot of sequencing, the experimental procedures still can have a low enough resolution some frequently. Um, at least so far, um, to not be able to deconvolute individual enhancers. Um, there, there could be a 5, 10, 15, 20 KB fragment could have multiple enhancers or multiple promoters on it. Um, that will hopefully go away as the experimental techniques get better and become cheaper, but so the other motivation is just to understand what protein binding events, RNA binding events in, when you have those, uh, sequence features, et cetera, predict these interactions. Can we? learn a signature for looping chromatin. And so even when we have very fine, high-resolution chromatin interactions, understanding the mechanism is still an interesting question. So we again used machine learning, and we showed that um, here in dotted lines are what happens with the closest gene or all genes in a window with an increasingly large window, and at low false positive rates, you almost never get the right gene in the dotted lines across these different cell lines, but our algorithm called Target Finder has very high accuracy, over 90 percent accuracy um, of our po a power to detect the true promoter enhancer interactions within TADS. Um, but what I thought was most interesting was why we can do so well. It wasn't so much because of what was going on at the enhancer or at the promoter, because you can imagine inside of a TAD there are many active enhancers and many active promoters, and they all look active. So what was really interesting was that what we uh, saw the, was the signature for when an interaction happens with it saying that this enhancer loops to gene A and say not to gene B, the information is on the intervening chromatin, so the piece that would be on the loop if there were a chromatin loop. And we found very different proteins bound to the loops than to non-looping pieces of chromatin. Um, in particular, a lot of signatures of heterochromatin on the loop. Um, cohesin and CTCF within about 5, 6 KB of the enhancer and promoter, but an absence of it on the loop. So if this loop were happening, there'd be some here and some here, but not here in the middle. 
Um, and that CTCF by itself wasn't particularly predictive, but if you combined it with various other proteins, including C the cell type specific transcription factors, you can literally read the high C data out just by looking at a handful of ChIP-seq data sets on the order of eight to 10 ChIP-seq data sets. So a few histone marks, and they're not the K27 acetylation or the K4 methylation marks that you would use to predict the enhancers and promoters, different ones, a few of those. Um, some of these cohesin complex proteins, um, perhaps CTCF, some of the cofactors that it has. And then you can literally read out a high resolution high C from that one gen D genomic signature with very high accuracy. So um, just to summarize this background or motivation section of the talk, um, we found that machine learning um, on biologically validated enhancers and interactions um, led to very interesting cell type specific predictions about gene regulation and highlighted the importance of um, really looking at specific enhancers that are the ones that are consistently looping to the same genes and that will validate when you do a, a, an assay like a reporter assay in an animal um, and, and that not all enhancer like regions are really doing this. Um, but um, to get to the second part of the talk, um, despite all these interesting observations, we found a lot of things that couldn't be explained um, by what I've described so far and what most of us have been doing. So um, one of them is functional variants that are outside of enhancers. So once we've done a really nice job of finding all the enhancers, why are we seeing some variants that aren't in those? Um, so, and by enhancers, I'm using that term loosely. It could be, I'm also including repressive elements potentially. Um, so uh, uh, variants that are just not um, in what seems to be any kind of what we would call a regulatory element that would interact with a promoter and uh, modulate expression of a gene. So ones that would be, say, on the loop of the chromatin. Well, the Target Finder project made a prediction about that. So the fact that we saw this interesting and very predictive signature on the looping chromatin that was different when an interaction was happening than when it wasn't, suggests that variants on the loop could be functional. And so instead of focusing on this enhancer variant that may or may not be functional in this example, maybe I should be looking at this variant over here that say creates a CTCF binding site and then now makes an interaction happen that wouldn't have happened before. Because now there's a signature on this looping chromatin that prevents that and maybe creates a loop here instead. And so we have, a, um, for a variety of different ENCODE cell types, predictions of regions on looping chromatin that aren't enhancers, but we think are modulating enhancer promoter interactions and would be interesting to test. And the approach, um, uh, low throughput version of, of that to really understand if this hypothesis holds would be to go into a few loci and really test these with genome editing. And if we see a signature, then to try to think about something that we could do genome-wide. So we're very excited about this. It's not the subject of the talk today, but a um, um, very um, big direction for us going forward. Um, and it makes sense. Um, we do see, for example, when you look in cancer cell lines, indels, structural variants that are affecting um, these kinds of binding sites for structural proteins. So um, what I uh, do want to talk about is another unexplained um, phenomenon for the rest of the time, and that is Variants that are in enhancers, so you have a sequence, you're pretty sure it functions as a regulatory element, it has a variant in it, but as far as we can tell, it doesn't disrupt a sequence motif. And that um, could happen because it's for a protein that we don't have a good motif model for. Um, but even when you do de novo sequence motif finding, you don't see that this is something that's uh, enriched. So, um, are there other explanations besides the obvious one that, well, we just haven't learned all the sequence motifs yet, which I think is true, but is there something else going on? And the reason um, we got really interested in this is we analyzed the ChIP-seq peaks for all, um, about, uh, about 250 ENCODE uh, data transcription factors and looked at the top 2,000 peaks, so the ones that were most confidently called and really strongly bound by the transcription factor, and 23% of them ha don't contain a sequence motif. And that's not just that they don't contain the consensus sequence or they don't match the PDWM, but that when we do de novo motif calling 
to take all those peaks and ask what's enriched? Is there maybe some motif we just didn't know about? We learned some new motifs. They don't, 23% don't even contain those new motifs. There's no enriched sequence, and that's using a very loose cutoff for calling a sequence enriched. So um, what's going on? Well, we became really interested in work by Remo Rose, uh, Richard Mann, Harman Busemaker, some of their colleagues on the structure of DNA and on how protein DNA binding um, is really a biophysical phenomenon. And the idea that maybe a mutation like this is altering the shape of DNA. Um, and that may or may not affect a sequence motif, but that proteins uh, are well known, to, uh, a number of DNA binding proteins are known to really recognize the shape, things like the major and minor groove width, the helical twist, the propeller, uh, the roll. And so um, maybe the, um, the, the, the mutations are affecting these biophysical features. So um, the idea would be um, motivated by work that these other labs have done on sequence motifs. So all the work in this field so far has focused on parts of the genome where there is a match to the sequence motif and shown that DNA shape can provide additional specificity or can distinguish between, say, two transcription factors that have pretty similar sequence motifs. Um, but we wanted to ask, what about this 23 percent of peaks that have no sequence motif? Is DNA shape maybe playing a role there, and maybe playing a very prominent role? So the idea is to develop an algorithm that does motif searching, just like you would for DNA sequence motifs, but it's searching for shape motifs. And then to apply that to all the ENCODE data, predict shape motifs, and see where they occur, what do they look like, are they the same as the sequence motifs or different? So um, this project was really enabled by um, a computer program from Rose's lab, Rima Rose's lab, called DNA Shape, where um, you can put in DNA sequences and they get translated into a vector of shape features. So um, anyone who's familiar with the biophysics of DNA will know what I'm talking about here. If you're not, trust me that these are describing different important physical aspects of DNA, and they're encoded basically in five MER sequences. So you take five base pairs and I get, I put it into the program and I get back a number for each of these shape features that tells me what the values are. Um, and those have been derived by his lab using molecular dynamic simulations. So what our work was, was to translate the whole genome with DNA shape and then to um, uh, develop an algorithm to do motif hunting in the DNA shape realm. So this is, um, we implemented this with Gibbs sampling, which is the approach commonly used in de novo sequence motif finding. And the criterion we're trying to minimize here is the distance between these feature vectors. We used Euclidean distance in the first pass. So these pairwise distances between instances, what your candidate instances of the motif are. And so um, once you learn, say, from a, a collection of believable binding sites what shapes you think a particular transcription factor prefers, you can then score other um, binding sites and ask whether they contain the motif or not, or call hits. And this is an example of what it would look like. This is a particular um, sequence feature, um, such as roll. And you can see in most of the DNA in gray here, you can see a huge variance in the values. And then when you get inside of a motif, the variance shown in gray is very low. And instead of just a wiggly background, there's a very distinct signature of values. So this would be what we would call a motif. And the null distribution is like this flanking region that you get a big variance. And then we look at that and we say, well, this is much smaller than a variance than you would expect. So we can call hits um, in a, a set of peaks that we didn't use to learn. Uh, the motif model, and then, of course, you find a bunch of them, and so the question is, are they, could they happen just by chance? And so we look in faint flanking DNA non chipseq peak regions of the genome nearby with similar sequence content, also call peaks, and then we do an enrichment test. And what we found was across two ENCODE cell lines here and a number of different shape features that many transcription factors have a shape motif. They're very common. Um, most transcription factors have more than one, so they recognize both, say, the role and the minor groove width, and they may preferentially use one in one cell type and the other in the other cell type, or they might, recognize, they might use both. Um, and 
what was really cool was comparing this to what you get when you do shape motif, I mean sequence motif discovery. So um, most peaks that, those peaks that don't have sequence motifs have at least one shape motif. It's often at the peak center, just like you would expect a sequence motif to be. And in about 25% of these ENCODE chip seek peaks, um, there are a sequence and a shape motif. So this begs the question, are they the same thing or are they different and working together? So they can be similar. Here's an example for NRSF. This is its roll motif. It has this wiggling roll. And when you take the sequences that are hits for this shape motif and then you just look in the genome, what sequences did I get, you can use those to build a logo. So discovering this was completely using the numerical values for role, but I can ask if there is a single sequence or a preferred sequence that gives this role, or are there just a bunch of sequences that give the same role? And there could be a bunch that give the same role because um, there's not like a one-to-one -one mapping between sequences and structural features. In fact, very different sequences can give the same role. But in this case, there's a, there are some consistent sequences, and they look very similar to the sequence motif that's in in factor book, but perhaps giving some flanking sequence that may provide some specificity. Here's an example where they're similar, but they're not the same. It's a refinement. So this is for CFOS. It's a propeller twist motif. And here this ATTGG core motif from the sequence motif appears in the role, in the sequences that have this role motif. But then there's this flanking GC rich region that's necessary to give this pattern that's not really uh, picked up as a part of the sequence motif. And this can go the other way, too, where the um, roll is uh, sort of, the, where the um, uh, shape is, a, say, a core part of a bigger sequence motif. Or they can be totally different. So, um, and this may, uh, and this um, will obviously suggest that they're not occurring at the same positions as in the genome, which I'll show you in a minute. So uh, here's a helical twist motif for math. This is the sequence that gives that, so it's pretty specific, and it really doesn't match the sequence motif. Now, the shape motifs that are different from sequence motifs can be um, nearby. So here's an example that has no sequence specificity, but it has a pretty specific helical twist. And here's, it doesn't, it can't match that because it has no sequence specificity, but we find it very consistently three base pairs away, upstream specifically of the sequence motif. Here's another example. This is for roll. And this is the sequence that drives it. It's totally different from this, and it's not right next to it. It's 30 base pairs away, very consistent peaks of this shape motif, 30 base pairs away, suggesting maybe a cofactor or a complex. And the shape motifs can be different between transcription vectors that have similar sequence motifs. So FOSS L1 um, and ATF3 are both BZIP transcription factors. They have very similar sequence motifs shown here. Um, uh, except they differ a little bit at this AG in the middle, and they prefer very different sequence motifs. Um, this one uh, likes helical twist with a certain pattern, and this one likes roll. Um, they share um, um, a uh, propeller twist motif that relates to some of the positions that are highly conserved in the sequence. Okay, so to wrap up, um, this is just really new, and we're barely getting started, so um, I have a lot of open questions. You probably do, too. Um, one is to sort of combine in a more rigorous framework this integration of sequence and shape motifs. Um, another is to start looking now in the different contexts. So we focused on the top 2,000 ChIP-seq peaks because we wanted to be in situations where we were really sure that the transcription factor was binding as we were benchmarking and getting this started. Um, but we want to start looking at overlapping peaks and at weaker peaks. Um, Another project um, involves a collaboration with Benoit Bruneau's lab where we recently published um, a work on deleting transcription factors and showing that you get ectopic binding of their cofactors at other places in the genome that drive aberrant gene expression. Um, we, wanna, we couldn't find a really compelling sequence explanation for those extra binding sites that you gain in the knockout, and we want to look at the role of shape there. And then finally, um, looking at whether uh, the, the DNA shape may provide some insight on cases where enhancers have conserved function over long evolutionary time periods without having conserved sequence. Maybe they have conserved shape. Um, and obviously, going back to the question I started with about non-coding mutations, we want to develop a scoring system for SNPs just like we did for, for sequ 
sequence motifs to ask whether SNPs w are predicted to change DNA shape or not. Um, I want to specifically acknowledge Sean Whelan, who worked on Target Finder, and Hassan Sami, who's uh, leading this work on DNA shape, and I'm happy to take your questions. Thanks. Yeah, if I understood correctly, you were looking for structure in each of the DNA shape features independent of the other features, and I'm wondering why that's the natural way to treat the information instead of trying to look at everything simultaneously. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so uh, that would be a nice extension to try to look at them together. Um, we thought that um, it that, uh, well, we've seen that often factors will have um, a very specific preference, say, for role, but not care at all about helical twist. And we were afraid if we put them all together in a simple way that the kind of noise would override the signal. If you did it in a good way where you could kind of um, sort of have something sparse that would not look at the noisy part and focus on the, the part that was specific, um, that would work. But for our first pass, we did them individually and then combined them. But I agree, some kind of integration, and then eventually integration also with the sequence motifs is where we're headed. Yeah, Zipeng. Um, that's really great, great results. Um, can you validate this using like MSAR kind of experiment? Say, cut out that piece that has no motif but has the shape motif to see if the TF actually binds. Yes. or look into PBM or other in vitro binding data. Yeah, absolutely. So the folks who've been developing some of the things that we base this work on um, were looking in like Celex data, but they were always doing it in cases where there was also a sequence motif, so we would now need to extend that to this case where we're kind of considering them separately. Um, but yes, that we absolutely have to do some validation. We just started this project a couple weeks ago, so we haven't done that yet. Yeah. So Katie, I have a question. So now yeah. you have the sequence motif, you have the shape motif. Let's just scan the human genome. Yes. And can I just direct predict the, 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 the chip sequence results much better just based on DNA sequence? Right, yes. Um, so I mean, we know you can kind of predict it from the sequence motifs, but oh. there's a lot that you can't predict. Right. The, the hypothesis is that would be explained by the shape motifs. And exactly, we're exactly. working on it, but we haven't done it yet. Cool, cool. Yeah. All right, let's uh, thanks Katie again. So now we will have the most important session for this three, D, uh, three days uh, workshop. So I think we have talked enough and uh, showed you what we think is the best for you. Of course, that c c there's always be wrong estimate. So it's time for you to tell us what we have done right, what we have done wrong, and how we can help you <laughs> to, uh, uh, cool. to, to, in, to make the ENCODE data and the software more accessible to you. So I also want to take this opportunity to ask all the uh, ENCODE members, current or past, please stand up. Uh, all the ENCODE members, please stand up. Bing, Eugene, stand up. And uh, wave to the people, all ENCODE people. So just in case we haven't answered your question enough, just look around, see who stand up, and you can approach, approach them, ask more questions, and how we can help you. At the same time, the uh, Mike Payson and uh, Dan Gilrist uh, is here. So they are the uh, program officer that uh, supervise ENCODE project. So if we haven't done enough, talk with them. I can make the process faster, I, I think. <laughs> so now I'll pass my mic to Mike. <laughs> All right, everybody. Uh, I'm Dan Gilchrist, one of the program officers from NHGRI who works with ENCODE. And I just want to say thank you all very much for coming here for sticking around to the bitter end and now we would really like to hear from you uh, what we can do to make the ENCODE resources most useful for your research um, and one of the key things we have to learn about what you want is a, a survey please take some time to fill that out before you take off if you fill it out while I'm talking I will not be offended in the least um, a very big hand to our speakers who came down uh, from far and wide and sometimes just across the hall there um, and gave some fantastic talks. Um, and I want to take a second to thank our hosts, the ENCODE DCC, everybody 
here at Stanford, I think they've done a fantastic job of keeping things running smoothly, um, just having things really well organized, bringing in piano players and beer and all kinds of fabulous stuff. So thanks very much to the DCC and especially to uh, Gene Davidson, who has done a lot of the heavy lifting for making this such a, an excellent event. And then I just also want to say thank you to all of the tutorial presenters. Um, I know it's tough sometimes to get up here and present something that uh, may be in some stage of experimental development and not know how well it's going to go. So they were all very brave to get up here, share their work with us. And hopefully this has been a valuable introduction to, to many of these tools. And also thanks to the ENCODE Outreach Working Group who spent a lot of time uh, planning this event. and. Um, especially Mike Cherry, Fong, and John Stamm, uh, who put in many hours working on this. So again, um, I'm going to plug this survey. Uh, I'm aware that this is not a survey monkey, this is a survey ape, but <laughs> hopefully it gets your attention. Please fill this out before you leave. We really need to know uh, what you think about ENCODE resources. And so there are a couple goals of this meeting. One is to hopefully uh, show you some of what ENCODE has to offer. And uh, there's a lot that ENCODE has to offer. We don't want folks wandering around in the, the desert out there. Um, but we, we want to guide you to the resources that can help your research um, move you in the right direction efficiently, um, hopefully more efficiently than the DC metro system, which is what I have put up there. Um, but we really want to direct you to what you need to make your research work. But the, the second key purpose of this meeting is that we really need to hear from you what we can do to make ENCODE resources uh, better um, available so they're, they're easier to access. And this includes both the, the scientific resources, the data, the tools that the consortium is putting together, but also outreach activities like this. We'd love to hear uh, what you think about that. Um, and I'll take two seconds and just say why this feedback is so important. So the ENCODE consortium is going to take what we hear from you here today and we use this for planning purposes um, to think about how we should focus our scientific efforts, how we should uh, potentially refocus data production efforts, and how we can improve uh, the presentation of the data and the resources to y'all. Um, and I just want to point out that there's a session. We have our annual consortium meeting next week. One of the kickoff sessions is going to be uh, a discussion of what we learned from this meeting, what we learned from last year's ENCODE uh, users meeting. We're going to take this feedback and try to really think about how we can um, put things out there that you all can use. And I also want to point out that NHGRI also uses feedback from these meetings. Um, we, we do this to focus, again, the ENCODE production efforts. Um, we use it to plan outreach efforts for ENCODE and other programs that NHGRI supports. And we use this to think about how we should shape resource projects like ENCODE, but also other resource projects that NHGRI is involved in. So please tell us what you really think. Uh, fill out the survey. Come talk to us. Uh, myself and I think Mike and many of the ENCODE consortium members will be around after uh, this is over. Um, feel free to email us and express your ideas. And then uh, we'd really like to open this up to you. Uh, grab a microphone or someone will hand you a microphone and tell us uh, what you think. So. Uh, one thing we're interested in is if we do another event like this, are there any sessions that you found to be just so fantastic that if we do another meeting like this, we have to do a session like that? This was, uh, this was great. I loved most of the sessions. Um, one, one thing I was wondering if it was possible to do in, in, in one of the tutorial type sessions, maybe have us uh, show us how to d download uh, uh, a data set from ENCODE and even do a simple analysis from that. 
maybe you know isolate the the peak sequences or some such exercise might be very helpful. Yeah, I mean, look actually look look down at the, a, a particular track, maybe the data set corresponding to a track on our computers, and anal do a simple analysis of, of some kind would be great. So I think it's it has been a much greater meeting than the previous time in terms of the practical session. I think it's the program has been uh, more adapted and less thick than the previous time, so I'm very happy. But uh, it would be possible to include, I, I know that there's been like three or four talks about how to link enhancers with, uh, with target genes like the, the previous one. So do a practical on that. So uh, a session sort of focusing on enhancer target gene linkages Hi, this is a fantastic uh, meeting, thank you. Um, I was wondering if it's, but what I got from here is mostly overview of the types of data that ENCODE has and you know, for some uses and uh, fantastic science that people do with it. Um, while I would really enjoy if there would be more practice and hands-on uh, type of meeting for specific uses, which would be more focused on specific types of analysis or specific types of data, and you know how really to bring it back to the lab rather than um, and to other people in the lab um, rather than basically like a more tutorial workshop type of thing than an overview type. So of sort thing. of spending more time getting down getting your hands dirty and, and working with the? Yes, and also I, I feel that there is a lot of things which can be done within code, some of which are relevant to what I do and some of which are much less relevant to what actually goes on in the lab. And I think it would be useful if there would be maybe satellite workshops or maybe several, workshop, several dedicated workshops throughout the year that you could work you know, specific tutorials or YouTubes online, how to do this or how to integrate that or what's possible for mouse, what's possible for human, and so on. I think that those are, are really great points. Um, a couple things that I'll uh, bring up since you already brought them up. We do have um, satellite sessions at some meetings. We have one, we actually have two, uh, one put on by the ENCODE DCC and one put on by Fong and uh, Ting Wong, the WashU browser. That's going to be at ASHG. Those are both going to be at ASHG this fall in Vancouver. We had one at the previous um, uh, ASHG meeting, and we're always interested in uh, putting out more of those. So if there are meetings that you think of that would potentially be good venues for these, we'd be happy to hear about that. Um, a second thing I'll mention is that uh, we try to make um, tutorial materials online available, um, both through the ENCODE portal and through the NHGRI website. Um, all of the videos from last year's users meeting um, are posted on the ENCODE portal along with slides, and they will be from this meeting too, but I think I'm also hearing from you that more focused sort of tutorial materials would be helpful. Yeah, and more hands-on type of things. I have a follow-up question. You're saying more practical hands-on, and for you, would this be more, I have this problem, how would I solve it with ENCODE data, or I want to do this particular process, what are the steps in it? So for me, for me specifically, there are two types of things that I would really love. Is one is you start with specific data set. For example, you start with a list of genes or with a list of regions. Or in in our specific case, we have a resource of genetic variation in mice, and we know a lot about phenotyping in those mice, and we mapped a lot of the genes of those mice, and so on, and. Uh, what layers can we add and how, step by step. 
The other would be, of course, if how we can integrate our own data. For example, we have hundreds of RNA-seq examples uh, into, into this, and in terms of how to access the, the whole pipelines pragmatically and, and not necessarily through the portal and, and so on. Um, I understand that that would not be an ideal focus for most of the people here necessarily in terms of you know, pragmatic access and processing hundreds of samples, but that would be something that I would be interested to come as a specific tutorial type of thing. Um, another thing that, for example, we had um, a meeting at UCLA, a workshop that was given by GATK, the, those people go out and do that. And that was very useful and popular because, basically because it's there, right? Because you can, it's not, you know, so traveling from UCLA here is not a big deal, <laughs> like some people who do, uh, who came much further. Um, but in general, it's, it's, I think it would be useful if, if that would be kind of more available. So you're suggesting next meeting is in LA next year? <laughs> um, sort of just a follow-up point because I'm also at uh, UCLA and there was, um, I've had discussions with people that there's interest in like for example maybe leading some type of tutorial at UCLA on ENCODE and I think this could be something more general that there's enough people who have ENCODE expertise at a lot of different universities where they could lead some type of session and what could facilitate this if there was sort of a streamlined set of material that somebody could take which covers lots of different um, topics about ENCODE and, and just present it. And I think we have some of that accumulating just from like workshops today and in these past few days. This is the first time I'm attending this meeting. Uh, my name is Raj Bhatt. I come from UCLA. Um, uh, first of all, I feel uh, the, the composition of this meeting was perfect. Uh, you can either have workshops or you have a meeting where you have paper presentations and you have conceptual advances and uh, things like that dis discussed. In this meeting, I thought it was extraordinarily balanced. We had uh, hands-on uh, uh, sessions, and then we had uh, terrific sessions. I think, uh, think the session yesterday morning uh, uh, was, was one of, in my opinion, one of the best sessions of this meeting. And so, so I think it will not, I don't know, I shouldn't say that, that definitely. Uh, having a dry tutorial session may not be as, will be, will be significantly useful for practical purposes. But in order to, 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 to incorporate and reach out to the community and uh, uh, present it as a resource for everybody, not for 100 people or 200 people here, it is important to for example, the talk or uh, the Nancy's uh, talk on the phenome was extraordinary. That uh, that brings in questions, and I would I would like to see thematically uh, that this meeting focuses on some of the problems in genome biology, and there are millions of problems. And once you focus thematically on two problems or three problems in one particular meeting, I think then you would attract people who are interested in addressing those questions to the meeting and present this as a resource that may be used to, to, to uh, investigate and initiate investigations in that particular area. For me, this meeting was extraordinarily useful because it introduced me the potential that, that exists in using ENCODE data. I have run a huge number of uh, gel retardation essays in my life. I still do them, uh, but but uh, I think uh, we need to graduate from that and 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 realize 
recognize the potential that MCODE provides. Uh, so I would keep tutorials and uh, uh, talks, conceptual advances together in a meeting to make it, to make it ma more relevant and more interesting. And I want to thank you all for making it so comfortable, so easy, uh, uh, using computers and worrying about us who is, who is doing what. Uh, people from the MCORD here and from Stanford. It was extraordinary help. Uh, they were looking over your shoulder and uh, that was the best part of it was that these people were there looking over your shoulder and wanted to make sure that you are going to where you are going. And Seth's whole presentation. This was a very balanced meeting and I, would use, I, I hope you would repeat this again. So one thing I think it might be interesting to include is like a session where people in the community can talk about what sorts of data from ENCODE they use most and what they think most be, might, might be most valuable moving forward. Uh, particularly with like the transition from ENCODE 3 to ENCODE 4. It might be nice to have input on that, like uh, whether or not uh, the certain data sets that are being produced are actually gonna be useful to the community. Um, and I think that there's definitely a balance there between what's obviously available for ENCODE PIs to do their own work and also what's available for the community to use as a general resource, but, but having some information and input on that would be very valuable. So let me just clarify. So you were asking us so what data sets are used the most by the community? Yeah. Uh, okay. I think Mike Chavez might have the answer. Uh, <laughs> how many, for example, how many times a data set has been downloaded and something like this? I, I really enjoyed the conference. I learned a ton. I have a very little feedback, but I have two things that I think might be interesting. Um, the first is that the lightning talks are so short that I think it, the ones that were most effective were people who said, look, here, I made this awesome figure. I used ENCODE, and here's how I did it. Like, so I, I, those were the ones that I really got the point, where people tried to present all their research. It got kind of lost sometimes. Um, so I think if the lightning sessions were almost like mini workshops uh, in the sense that, you know, this is how I used ENCODE for one or two things, that might be effective. Um, and the other is that uh, people who are very new to bioinformatics tend to like to use Galaxy. And I don't know how hard it would be, but if the ENCODE pipelines could make their way into Galaxy, I think they would be pretty widely used then. Thanks. Um, my comment is related with the second point there, right? What new resources could be created? And yesterday I talked a little bit uh, about that. And uh, for example, for me, I, I mean, I work in a very specific field, right? Where I consider cancer as a hierarchy of cells, right? And I do m much more like functional studies and then try to use ENCODE or TCGA to see if that can predict um, re the relevance in cancer, that is at least my feel. But the problem of the sources that are available, right, are, or they are cell lines that sometimes don't mimic what is really happen, or they are pool of, or a biopsy or a pool of bulk cells, where those bulk cells can be a mixture of endothelial, lymphocytes, and real um, cancer cells, right? So I was like wondering if the ENCODE, probably not ENCODE 4 or 5, but maybe ENCODE 10, will approach the single cell RNA sequencing. I know single cell chip is impossible to do, but if it, you guys are going to the direction of taking in consideration the hierarchy of tissues to study stem cells and more differentiated cells, and not only in the embryonic field, but more somatic uh, stem cells. Uh, 
uh, I, I, a little bit new uh, to the input. I think maybe it would be helpful like uh, add something like a uh, bigger picture of the encode project, like uh, how, uh, where the center, uh, how the tissue uh, or sample selected, and uh, that kind of thing maybe very helpful to the new new user or uh, new, yeah new users. And the second thing is like uh, uh, because this hits to modification mark or any kind of element is very tissue specific. I, I don't know whether you have any plan like to add like uh, the non coding variant annotation by like a tissue type or cell type, that kind of thing. No, the, the uh, non-coding variant annotation. So we have uh, like uh, several two there, but uh, right now I don't think it's uh, uh, tissue s specific, maybe uh, uh, is, is uh, aggregate, aggregate annotation, right? Like uh, if someone interested in uh, uh, the, the variant in a particular tissue, whether that kind of a tissue speed, like if you select this tissue, I, I want to annotate this kind of particular variant. That kind of thing. So I know have a right they you when you give us SMP, they can tell you whether this is enhanced or not in what cell cell types. Right. And then they have their most recent version. It can give you a goodness of uh, what tissue it might be function in that specific uh, tissue. I just have a small suggestion. Uh, if you could provide a list of tools that are using encode data, uh, I think that would be perfect. A list of tools that are using yeah, you you have a you have you have a list of publications that are associated, right, associated to encode data, right? Yeah. So if you could have a list of tools. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like target funder, those. Right. I, th that I might be wrong, but I, I, my impression is I think on the Uncode project, we, we, we might already have a list of tools uh, where I think it should be linked you to the download website. I, I will double check it. I, I think it's there, yeah. Hi, to clarify, oh, okay. Um, if you just go to the actual portal, then yeah. under materials and methods, you will see under software tools, and then you can go there. But we can definitely add some of the more, these are tools that we use often in the pipelines or for QC metrics, but we can actually add some more tools that use ENCODE data there as well. <laughs> also on the, um, on the encyclopedia, about the encyclopedia, a lot of these tools are contributing to what they would call the encyclopedia. So that page actually has links to many of these tools. Um, and that can be increased and or we could link out from there. But that page was what uh, Ziping was trying to show. Um, so Fung's uh, element browser is linked off of there and Factor Both is linked off of there. I think he's looking at that page. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think to make my suggestion a specific, maybe uh, I'm I'm looking at uh, the the data type uh, and the click uh, uh, publications. You can see a list of publications. Maybe maybe you can create a filter called tools. Ah. If if this publication is related to tools or just a research article. Or yeah. So under community. Yeah, I know what they are. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Under community publications. We do list people that are developing oh, software tools. So they're not necessarily tools that use ENCODE data, or rather they're publications where someone developed a software tool and they used ENCODE data possibly to test it out. I think, Sue, I think that's a, that's a fantastic suggestion. Yeah. I think uh, if you have a query, you type in this tool, type in certain data, and then boom, there's like 10 publications using this tool and those, pub those data sets. So it would be interesting. Yeah, so my, my question is like involvement. So how the like community scientists or researchers can get involved in this uh, uh, fantastic project like from long term or right? You are already doing that. <laughs> 
Yeah, I mean, there, there, there's a few different ways that, that people can get involved within code. Okay, I mean, we just went through a round of um, soliciting grant applications and that has closed. But ENCODE in the past has been an open consortium and likely it will continue to be so. That means that people can join the ENCODE consortium without having ENCODE funding. On our website, we have the process for doing that or feel free to contact any of the NHGRI program staff. Other people get involved in it informally. There are people they know in the project and they ask questions and make suggestions. And I made a, a, an offer at the beginning of, right after lunch yesterday, saying that in the next round, we are likely to be soliciting ideas for samples, especially if people can actually procure the samples that consortium might do. And also we're interested possibly in taking in community data. So if some of you have large data sets of transcriptomic epigenomic data, and if we move ahead from that, we'd like from, to hear from you of what you have and consider bringing that in. So, so those are some ways that people can be involved. As Fong said, we, we, we have different outreach events. We're trying to encourage people to speak up and say what's useful about outreach events, what's useful about the project so we know better how to do things. All right, so um, I hate doing surveys. I'm gonna guess a lot of you hate doing surveys. I hate looking at surveys, but they are incredibly useful. And one of the most useful things about surveys, if you're not used to getting people sending you surveys, is seeing what are the comments that pop, over, uh, pop up again and again. So please, even if you're thinking, oh, everybody's probably gonna say this, why should I say it? It's, we are aware that we cater to people that have lots of different backgrounds and do lots of different things. And it's enormously useful to get a sense of 100 people asked for this versus one person asked for that. And obviously, if 10 people fill out the survey instead of 100, then we don't see these patterns. So if you can, please do that. And, and I've got one, one last question for the group, and that is if, so you've been to this uh, meeting now, if some colleague or friend of yours says, hey, this, is, this event's coming up, should I go to it? You having been to it, would you say, yeah, go, it was a good experience, eh, or don't waste your time? And I ask this as a resource allocation question. You know, we, we put uh, people's effort and money into this, and if it helps people out, it's a good choice. And if it doesn't, then it's a bad choice. I mean, so if a friend asked you, would you say, yes, you should go? Would you say, eh, maybe? And would you say, no, I didn't get that much out of it? Okay, thanks. Okay, so I'm the last thing here. I just wanted to give you um, um, a little bit of information. So for, for me, speaking for the DCC, this has been a really great meeting for us because our job is to distribute data and to understand the use cases and things like that. And I think we've, we've learned an awful lot about that. So it's great that it's important for you, but it's also very important for us. I'd like to say, so there's, uh, I think it was 230 attendees, um, people that actually checked in, not just the ones that paid and didn't check in. Uh, I think we had uh, 150 people that finished the RNA-seq, ChIP-seq pipelines yesterday. So that's, um, you know, great, great, you, you've, you've, you've done it. Um, hopefully all of you have done it. Uh, let's see, we had 80 to 100 people that stuck around for the lightning talks. I mean, that was really tough after a 12-hour day. Uh, so everybody that gave a lightning talk, you know, really great, you, you stimulated people to stay. Um, and I guess, unfortunately, we had a lot of wine left over last night, and that's too, too late to share that, but you know, next time there's free wine, you know, heck around it, okay? So, um, <laughs> let's see, okay. So the weather's nice today, I don't need to go on to that. Okay, if you wanna stay in, in touch with us on the encodeproject.org, go under uh, help and contacts, and there's a place you can subscribe to the ENCODE uh, announce list um, so that you'll get regular sort of updates about things. It's not a real high traffic sort of list, uh, but certainly that's where you'll keep, uh, you'll learn about new updates and things primarily. There's also an email address there for the help desk. Um, you know, any, any comments that you want to say to any of us, uh, go to the help desk. We try to answer things within a few hours, if not a day, 
uh, the whole group sort of sees that as well. So, so uh, they're certainly easy to stay in contact with us, I think. Um, I did want to say one little thing to, from my perspective of the DCC. So, you know, there's an increased concern about, you know, transparency, reproducibility, um, openness of data and research and things. And I, to me, what ENCODE is all about is addressing that, right? So um, I don't know how many of the PIs from labs are still here, but, you know, to, to me it's, it's really impressive that they're committing, you know, their normal research lab to do stuff the way the consortium says to do it as opposed to the way their postdoc wants to do it, uh, which may be great research, but, you know, there's got to be standards for things. Um, as well as the, the computational folks that are doing it in sort of defined ways, sharing all of that software, sharing the data and things. So I think, you know, really addressing this transparency, openness, standards is, is really, you know, what this is all about. I think NIHGRI has created this to sort of be a core nucleator of uh, research in this area. And um, so they should be commended, commended too, of course. Uh, they're funding it, but this is for outreach here. They're putting in a significant amount of money for the outreach. You'll notice there's no sponsors here. Um, there's no company saying, you know, buy our stuff to do your better assay. It's because NIH wanted it to be, you know, this sort of neutral ground, okay? Um, so I think that's, that's, that's really great. Um, you know, like I say, you, you guys have made this an important meeting because of the questions and your inter interactions on things. And, um, okay, so uh, it was really this outreach uh, committee that did so much, and I think Dan mentioned most of this. I just do want to say one more time, and everybody sort of talked about the DCC, but I'm, I'm really uh, proud and really thankful for the DCC group that uh, actually did so much. Um, all the wranglers, all the developers, everybody was actually here, and in particular, some that haven't been recognized specifically. So Edon and, and Jason were the, the mic runners, okay? All these wonderful pictures you've been seeing were done by Forrest. Edon and Jason's a regular job is uh, Wranglers, and Forrest is a UI guy. Um, and of course, Cricket and Seth, who did a fantastic job with the tutorials, particular uh, Seth for standing up there and being so clear. Uh, so, okay. So, and, and um, I want to wish you uh, safe travels home. Um, you know, we hope to do this again somewhere. Um, um, like I said, last year was East Coast, this is West Coast. Um, so we'll hope to see you again. Okay. Thank you.